interesting, this is an interesting thing to know. It's called the binomial effect size display. Effect size is the magnitude of an effect, right? And, and it's not an easy thing to get a handle on, although you really need to if you're going to be a psychologist, because in any study, there's an effect size indicator, a correlation of, often, or an R squared, which is the correlation squared, or a cones D, which is uh, the effect size expressed in standard deviations, or something like that. But you, you kind of have to understand that at a basic level to understand what statistics actually do. And there's this phenomenon called the binomial effect size display that can help you understand, what, like in an embodied sense, what the magnitude of a correlation means. So here's how it works. Imagine that you have a predictor of 0.20. So the correlation is R equals 0 0.20 between um, phenomena 1, we'll say conscientiousness, and phenomena 2, workplace performance. 0 0.20 correlation. The question might be, well, how much, how much would you improve your predictive capacity over chance levels if you applied that predictor? And the answer is that the R is the difference between the odds ratio. So let me explain that. So, 0 0.50, 0 0.50. If you subtract one from the another, you get zero. So the predictive validity of selection by chance is zero. 0 0.50 minus 0 0.50 equals zero. That's the predictive validity of chance. If you have a predictor of 0 0.20, which is approximately, that's sort of the low end estimate for conscientiousness, then that would change your odds ratio from 0 0.50, 0 0.50, right, random, to 0 0.60, 0 0.40, because 0 0.60 minus 0 0.40 is 0 0.20. And so the correlation coefficient turns out to be the the difference between the odds, between the odds. So, and so it gives you a quick rule of thumb. So for example, so if you have a 0 0.20 predictor, that gives you 60-40. If you have a 0 0.30 predictor, that gives you 65-35, because 0.65 minus 0.35 is 0 0.30. And if you have a 0.6 predictor, which is really up on the high end, right? You really start to push your, the limits of statistical predi prediction validity at that point. That gives you 0 0.80 minus 0 0.20. And so what you've done, if you use a predictive uh, uh, predictor that has a correlation coefficient of 0 0.60, which you could get, for example, if you took conscientiousness and combined that with a good test of IQ for predicting complex jobs, you might be able to get up to 0.6. That moves your odds ratio of selecting an above average person for the position from 0 0.50, 0 0.50 to 0 0.80, 0 0.20. So it cuts your, your failure rate by more than half, right? Brings it down from 0 0.50 to 0 0.20. Because 0 0.80 minus 0 0.20 is 0 0.60. So that's a really good thing to know. That's called the binomial effect size display. It's a really good thing to have in your mind. It's very simple. It's just, a, it's just subtraction. And it, it gives you some sense of the power of, of, of statistical prediction. Now, the question might be, well, let's say you had a predictor of 0 0.20, conscientiousness. You might say, well, if you square the R, that gives you 4% of the variance. Who the hell cares? 4% of the variance. You've left 95% of the variability between people in terms of their performance unexplained. You might say, well, why even bother? Well, the answer to that question is, how much difference in productive output is there between people? Because if there's a tremendous degree of productive of difference in productive output between people, then increasing your ability to predict someone's performance, even by some relatively small increment, might have massive economic utility. You know, if, if let's say the top 10% of your people are 50 times as productive as the bottom 10% of your people, then shifting your ability to predict up so that you have more of those extremely high performing people or less of the extremely low performing pr people might more than pay off might more than pay for itself from an economic perspective, even though your prediction, your predictor isn't doesn't have that massive amount of power. Well, and that actually happens to be the case. So back in 1968, there was a guy named Walter Michel, and he had reviewed, he's a social psychologist, he reviewed the personality literature up to that point and concluded that the typical personality measure only predicted the typical performance measure at about 0.2. And that's actually remained relatively stable. I would say it's a little higher than that, it's probably 0.25, especially if you do things like correct for measurement error and so forth. And what Michel said was, because it's only 0.25, let's say, you square that, that's 5% of the variance, you leave 95% of the phenomena unexplained, you might as well not even bother measuring personality. And so that actually killed the field of personality from a psychometric perspective for about 25 years, really until about the early 1990s, when people woke up and thought, wait a minute, what are the typical effect sizes in other domains of prediction? And then they found out that, well, the 0 0.20 correlation that was typical of, of personality prediction was actually pretty damn good by social sciences or health sciences standards. Like it doesn't sound good when you just think about it as an absolute measure, because it leaves 95% of the phenomena unexplained. But when you compare it to other things that people consider of reasonable magnitude, then it turns out that personality psychologists are doing just fine. And then also in the 1990s, and I'll show you some of this, there were economic calculations done. And the, so one of the calculations would be, well, imagine that you have 